Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Friday, the 16th day of August, year of our Lord, 2024. I do pray this finish well. A muggy day out there, but a very nice day. Nonetheless, not, not overly hot, just a, a little uncomfortably muggy. But hey, we're not shoveling the snow, and that's coming soon enough. You know, you just kind of one day you just sort of notice, yeah, the daylight hours are getting shorter. Uh, you know, you know that uh, on the calendar, but it just sort of you know sneaks up, and you do reach a time as you approach the. You can move about a month from the uh, equinox, the uh, um, the ushering in of uh, of uh, fall, when there'll be twelve hours of daylight and twelve hours of uh, darkness. But you do notice because it changes as it changes more rapidly uh, each day. Uh, than it does near the uh, the uh, solstices. Um, so it, all of a sudden you do kind of sort of wake up and there's like, man, it's getting dark earlier than it seemed to. And, you know, uh, that's going to happen in, until December. And then we'll start heading, if you will, back toward the sun. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord to sing praise to him, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. And tonight, we turn again, according to the daily lectionary, we turn to the second book of Samuel, second Samuel, chapter six, tonight reading verses one through 19. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned of the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Duza and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were making merry before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there because of the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had burst forth against Uzzah. And the place is called Paris Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained at the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all the belongings to him, and all that belongs to him, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and fat an animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. And the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings, the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, and distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. And that is the word of the Lord. And it's a fascinating word of the Lord. And I want to focus in our brief time together this, this evening on, on well, the, what's happening with the Ark and then on this account of Uzzah. 
Now, all their intentions of all these people that we hear of in the story, maybe with the exception of uh, David's wife, Saul's uh, daughter, are good. Okay? Uh, they, they want to move the Ark of God to Jerusalem, the city of David. And David wants it. You know, he's the king now. Uh, he actually has been anointed, but now Saul's gone, and, and he is the one who's reigning. And he wants the ark near him. And we hear at the end of the account that a tent is pitched, the tabernacle is pitched. So one of the things that we first notice is how the ark is being moved. God was very specific about who and how the ark could be moved. The ark is this box. Uh, it is uh, made out of a specific type of wood, according to the instructions of God. And it is it is overlaid with gold and then and then there is the golden uh, mercy seat, the solid gold mercy seat on it. You know, it's a few feet by a, a couple of feet um, uh, wide. It's um, And inside are the Ten Commandments. And God comes, as we hear in this text, and rests upon the cherubim there on the, the mercy seat, the atonement cover. And we've talked about that previously. So only the priests, the Levites, could move the ark. There were there were poles that were in these permanent rings, and the poles were supposed to be kept in the ark, the rings at the base of the ark, to lift it up and bear it. You know, the, the poles were to remain in that tent. Remember, you see some wonderful depictions of the ark where it's got the covering, there's a covering over the ark, uh, so that people wouldn't, you know, because it's terrifying, uh, that people wouldn't see it, and just the poles are sticking out. And uh, um, it had to be, we see David gets a little afraid uh, and he doesn't want the ark near him, and then it goes well with the household of Obed-Edom, and then he does bring it finally to Jerusalem. And that's really the heart of what we want to discuss as we're talking about this movement of the ark. So you have these two men that are, you know, one is driving this little cart, and you can imagine like a two-wheel cart with a flatbed, and the ark is resting on that, and, they, and it's uh, uh, a couple of you know wooden um, poles coming out from the cart that are, that are in some form or another uh, lashed to the, the animal that's, that is drawing them. And so the, the, it's not a, like a four-wheeled cart, so the, the cart can stumble quite easily. You know, so if the ox stumbles, the ark may, or the, the, the cart may tip. And it's all Uzzah, who's following behind, sees the ark tipping and places his hand out to stop it. Who wouldn't do that? We would do that, right? Um, and what, what's his reward? It's a good, you know, you can't look at that and think, well, that's bad. It's bad for one reason. We'll talk about that in a moment. But, you know, it's like, okay, you know, which, it's just a gut reaction to this car's moving. It's probably not a big car because that arc wasn't huge. And, you know, he, he, he just doesn't want this beautiful thing. And it might even have had the covering on it uh, to fall off the cart that he's smote struck down. Uh, I remember doing this, a skit of this. We had this wonderful, when I was in Wyoming, and I was just out there a few years ago to bring a kid to a, a young man to the Lutheran Youth Camp, but uh, I used to bring a group of kids up there, and it was so much fun, these wonderful kids. And it went from about like uh, 11th or 8th graders, and that was always the cabin I got assigned to, these squirrely young men. Uh, it was fun. All the way up to uh, seniors in high school and just wonderful kids. It was always nice and how, how close you can get, how much you can get to know these kids in just a few days. But each cabin had to do a skit. And uh, it's funny what the kids gravitate towards. Our, our boys gravitated towards this text. And uh, one of the poor kid who was, uh, who was uh, got pummeled uh, by these angels. Because you have to enact it, you know, get smote. Oh, my God. We had to set out all these mattresses and stuff like that. Uh, last time I was up there, we did... Uh, um, the theme was judges. And I would say half of the, the cabins did the disembowelment of uh, um, uh, one of the uh, enemy rulers uh, gets disemboweled. Uh, that's recorded for us in the book of Judges and how the kids, uh, not graphically, but interestingly, depicted that disembowelment. Some people use new, the big long noodle balloons that you know balloon uh, uh, performers make animals out of. Uh, we used towels. Uh, balloons was a good idea, <laughs> but uh, it was that was great, you know. Anyway, um, don't be afraid to teach your kids these things, because one of the things we want to learn here tonight is God isn't safe. 
Okay, uh, that really, we just began our theme of Amos, and it actually comes up in my newsletter, which I just finished last night and will be distributed in a few days. Um, God is good, he's holy, but he's not safe. You have to come and stand before God through the door, which means through the way he says. Now, this is for your safety because of who he is. In that goodness and that holiness, uh, God cannot tolerate sin in his presence. Well, what's he to do? He wants us to be with him. Yet we're fallen. We are cursed. We are born in sin. We we receive it like we receive our hair color and our eye color. It's passed down to us from our parents. It's the curse. Uh, it's the curse of Adam. Well, of course, that is Christ. We are covered with the blood of Christ in Christ through our new creation. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We don't know we can go to the Father except through him. But in Christ, we can stand before God with a good conscience, meaning knowing our sin, knowing that we shouldn't be in the presence of God, but because we are covered with the perfect righteousness of Christ, his holiness, we can stand in the presence of God. It's like a shield, if you will. Um, it also, you know, Christ also puts our sin to death, receives our punishment. So there, there's much more going on than him just being a shield there. But uh, uh, you know, our sin is put to death in him, but we're covered with his righteousness and all everything he did. So only in Christ can you stand before God. So this is, you know, this is what happens to Uzzah. You know, you can have all the good intentions you want, but you got to come through the door. Uh, you know, so this is this immediately does away with those. And this is not the specific text we go to when we think about why. When people ask me, why don't we give eulogies in church? And we don't. We do eulogize those that we love. That's to speak good about them. From the standpoint of, you know, at the funeral luncheon, uh, the, at the visitation, and just in life, we can remember the good times we have with those people. But every person you know, if you know them well, you've been blessed with very good times, but you've also had some dark times with them. You know, where sin is reared its head, they might, you, you, you know, you got to fight, you didn't treat each other well. Anyway, eulogizing, you know, the, the, what it's become in sort of our culture is here are the good reasons why this person should be in heaven. You know, and, and it's a way of saying, you know, you know, what, you know, God, you know, you know, God gave them lemons and they made lemonade. You know, God, uh, you know, they were following God's cart, God, God's, God's tabernacle, and they stuck out their hand and stopped it. What a good work. They, they, they're rewarded. They're in heaven, not according to this. That's why we don't do eulogies in the sense of where we, you know, because that's the promise. People, we, people remember the eulogizing and they don't remember Christ. Now, I suppose it can be done. I'm not that gifted of a preacher where, you know, you can, you know, have people give all these eulogies and then speak Christ in such a beautiful, powerful way that that's all, that that's what people remember. Well, God bless those people who can do that. I'm not one of them. And, you know, you, you just know because you have conversations afterwards where people are remembering what they're talking about. It's not thanks be to God for the blood of Jesus Christ. It's what you want. That this is the reason grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, you know, um, uh, the loved one that you're bearing is, in, is now in the presence of God in a way that we wait to do. And all the liturgy points to that. You know, um, you know they don't remember that. They just remember, oh, the good things that they did. And, how this, and people do think that you just have to be a nice person and that gets you to heaven. Now, that's a, that's a sliding scale, right? Uh, that's a self-defined bar. God here puts an end to that. No. Even if you have the best of intentions and you come into my presence apart from the way I tell you, which means apart from Christ, you will die. Who is it dies? And David is terrified. You know, he's, you know, he is, it says, um, uh, a, is angry, you know, because the Lord burst forth against Uzzah. And he's got to be angry with himself. It doesn't say who he's angry with, but, you know, because it's like, I didn't obey the word of God. I didn't have the priest carry this on the poles the way they're supposed to. And uh, and then this happened, and it's my fault that Uzzah's dead. Now, um, well, it's just I had another thought of that, but I'm just going to save that for another time. So David was afraid of the Lord that day, as we all should be. It is a fearful thing you know, to come and stand in the presence of God. Think of the way our churches are typically built. You have, um, you, you know, usually outside of the chancel area. The chancel area is where the altar is. 
and in our churches, there's typically either stairs that lead up to where the altar is. So it's it's in a focal point. It's high. It's kind of raised above. Um, sometimes set way back. That's really cool when it's done. I'll tell you a story about that in just a moment. Um, but often there's a fence, as as there is in our church. There's a couple of churches in the area that don't have a, a, a like a fence or a railing, but it is a fence. Um, uh, and it's the you know, and then what's kind of standing guard of the fence is the pulpit and the lectern, where you hear the word of God, where you hear about you know what the gift is and who God is and who you are in relation to Him and what's the purpose of all this and how do you know you're saved and how do you know you can stand before God without fear and you know what Christ has done for you. So the, you, you go through the font, you, you go through the water, you're ushered into the kingdom of God, and then before you go into his presence, you're taught. And then you receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the Lord's Supper, and you, know, you, you come inside the fence, if you will. It's a beautiful church in a, a wonderful little town called Seboing, Michigan. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, Huron County, up in the, there we, God gave everybody a thumb. I'm probably not holding it up right for you. Uh, but a thumb, everybody has on their uh, hand a map of Michigan. So uh, this is west and this is east. Okay, I'm probably not holding that right for you. But here is uh, you know, the thumb, and I lived in the thumb. Uh, so you have you know, Mackinac Bridge up here, Upper Peninsula is up here, um, Saginaw, uh, um, big city, big automotive city, it's not so big anymore. And then south, you'd have to, about an hour and a half, hour, two hours south, you'd have Detroit. Well, in that thumb, there was a little town called Seaboing. Uh, it, it was a few thousand people, so it was uh, maybe a bigger town for that part of the world. And just beautiful. I used to love driving through. There was just a beautiful drive in the country. Long drive to get anywhere. Um, beautiful motorcycle ride. Oh, my gosh. I ride a motorcycle in case you're not aware of that. But the beautiful church, it was a, these people took care of that church, as most uh, um, churches do. Oh, my gosh. I mean, this church was not new. But it was pristine, the way these people cared for it, from the undercroft, the classrooms in the basement. Uh, the, um, they had a school wing, and they used a lot of that, and they built on some, like a fellowship hall and some office uh, recently. But the church itself, which was old, was in perfect condition because of the people. They knew it was a special place. But the, you walked in, and it was kind of a classic structure. If you looked down from the top and looked across, you had a long uh, uh, nave. Uh, sanctuary, pews, 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 and it did have a little balcony uh, in the back, an organist, and, and then on either side, um, there was a choir on one side, and then uh, pews on the other side, um, like transept, it's called, and then the chancel. And you had to go up, I want to say six steps to get into the chancel, and then right at the, the, the top of those stairs, on one side of the pulpit, one side of the lectern, at the foot, on the ground, on the main level, where the pews were, was the font. So just that symbolism. But then way back, you know, like probably seven or eight steps back, like regular steps, was another step up at a railing. So the communion rail was behind the pulpit and the lectern, and then behind that, up on another step, you know, so six or seven, another, you know, six or you know, maybe three steps back, was the altar. Beautiful white oak all around it, a big cross above it. Oh, it's magnificent. Oh, my gosh. I used to love when I had the opportunity to preach that church. Some of my dear friends were pastors of the church. One of them is still out there now, Pastor Michael Boyer. What a blessing he is to the Office of Holy Ministry. Just a much younger man, much more handsome, just a great, great guy. Anyway, um, this young man is, uh, so I didn't turn my phone off, and now people are trying to call me. Uh, Anyway, um, great pastor out there in Sibuya. But it was so weird because you were standing at the altar. And it was a visual reminder of what I was talking about. You had the walls, these white oak walls. And the, there were a couple of doors, but they were built in. So when the doors were closed, you didn't know where they were there. You had these white oak walls that went down the sides uh, of the chancel. And then the step down and then more steps down. So you're like, those look at the people in the pews way out there. They were way out there. So it was this reminder built into the architecture of the church of the holiness of God, and you have to approach God on his terms, not your terms. I've had a couple of people over the years, not many, but uh, it was one was a, uh, a pastor in a church body um, nowhere around here, uh, and I was really dismayed, you know, that he was, everyone has a right to communion. Now, he was saying that, you, you know, the church 
can't tell anybody no. There are times we have to. For these reasons, it was God who sets the parameters of who can have communion and when you can have communion, uh, not us. There's no rights when we stand before God. You know, uh, we, we simply submit to God. And he blesses us with many things. But uh, um, we approach God on his terms. We come to the door that he opens, which is Christ. And then it's wonderful because you're never worrying about, was I good enough? You know, what will they say at my funeral? Was I good enough? It's always, but does it matter? I'm covered with the blood of Christ. I am covered with God's goodness um, in Christ. And my sin has been put to death in Christ. Uh, and you don't have to worry about it. That's what it means to have a good conscience before God. And so this whole text today, as harsh as it seems, and it does seem harsh, is teaching us exactly that. That you, you just can't go and stand in front of God any way you want. And God says, I'm going to show you how to do it. And you have to do it this way so you can live. He wants us to be with him. But you have to come through the way uh, that he establishes so we can live. Otherwise, we're going to die. And I mean die, like permanently death, hell, you know, the whole thing. So come through the door. You know, uh, and again, this is for those of you who maybe are sitting at home and watching this, I have no idea who watches these things. There's no record of it unless you make a comment. Uh, if you are thinking this is good enough, it isn't. Um, I do pray God uses these things, but I hope he uses those to you know, get you off your butt and get your fanny into church and to come and receive the gifts, to come and hear the sermon, to see your brothers and sisters, to be encouraged and admonished by your brothers and sisters, to have the pastor look you in the eye and forgive you your sins, and to receive the gift of the Holy Supper. Um, you know, come through the door. Uh, and, and teach your children that as well. All right. So enough about that. Let's now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people in Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for the preaching of the Holy Cross of our Lord Jesus Christ throughout your church, that we may resolve to know nothing among us except Christ and him crucified, and that the spread of this life-giving, saving knowledge would be um, carried throughout the world and go throughout the world. We pray for the persecuted and oppressed, those persecuted and oppressed for your name's sake, that they may stand firm and make a bold confession. And as always, we pray for the sick and dying, that you may place your healing hand upon them. Bless those who travel, guide their steps. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously given me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. Pray into your hands, I commend myself, my body, soul, all things. Let your holy angel be with me, the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I'll sing a little bit of uh, 507, Holy, Holy, Holy. 
Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which wert and art and evermore shall be. That is uh, stanzas one and two of four of Holy, Holy, Holy. With that, my dear friends in Christ, I bid you a blessed rest. By God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night.